this is Rosia Shaw, and I'm here to guide you through the daily activities, events, and the in and in outs of what occurs on the street. So sit back, relax, enjoy your cup of coffee, purchase one of the some popcorn box, and enjoy a word from the metaverse. The news. Chaos Computer Club uh, is a big conference that happens every year. Uh, it takes place in Europe and is one of the bigger deals that is out there. And it does a lot of all sorts of different uh, tech stuff from software to hardware to uh, digital movements to workshops. Just anything and everything you can name of. And a, a broad spectrum of different subjects, uh, ideas, concepts are, are brought forth through the, this uh, organization. <clears throat> So here we go. Uh, Chaos Computer Club has an update. Uh, Chaos Computer Congress is moving to Liz uh, Zig. The 34th iteration of the annual uh, Chaos Communication Congress will take place in December, but at a new location, the Congress and Convention Center in Liz Zig. Congress had to find a new home because in its former venue, the Congress Center Annenberg, will be undergoing a general makeover. The new venue in Liz Zig will provide participants much more space to tinker with. Uh, the CCH was home to the Congress since uh, 2012, and over the years we've developed a strong friendship with the team on site, so we're sad to have to leave. Finding a new location was not easy. The large number of participants combined with the special demands regarding technology, lecture halls, workshop space, as well as areas to party and hang out pose a challenge to any convention center in Germany. Even the CCH would not be able to accommodate any more than last year's 12,000 participants. We're not trying to grow at all costs, but expanding our cultural reach is very important to us. It's always painful to be forced to reject more and more interesting people at the door each year, explained uh, Dirk England, CCC spokesperson. With access not only to the main Congress Center, Lisbeck, but also to parts of the neighboring convention halls, the CCC is confident to find balance between the potential for moderate growth and the change that became the event's unique atmosphere. Everything's on track to, to, for smooth co- cooperation. Dirk England said that about the team in Lisbon. After all, the city can look back on over 850 years of tradition hosting trade fairs. As usual, the gates will be open to the participants on December 27th, and despite the challenges of moving to a new location, our goal is to keep ticket prices stable. And of course, we will continue to resist commercialization. On one hand, the new location offers more space for some some more participants. On the other hand, we're going to need to depend more than ever on the solidarity of the community. By purchasing supporter tickets, one can directly enable others to attend at affordable rates. Just as last year we're aiming for a larger black zero in profit, the start of pre-sale is going to be announced at CCC's events blog at events CCCD. Planning content for the 34C3 has already begun, and there will be a launch of the call for participants soon. Hacker Assemble in the Hack Center will be organized this year mainly around themes and interests rather than the region. This should encourage an even more uh, interregional and international exchange between the communities, Dirk England explained. And of course, we'll, we'll make every year to, to tame the convention hall's atmosphere and make it as cozy as our participants have come to expect over the 33 years of the Congress history. So there you go, a great little announcement. Okay, drone journalists face seven years in prison for filming Dakota Pipeline. Uh, this is from Motherboard by Jason Colbert. Police called the use of the drone an act of violence. A citizen journalist in Morton County, North Dakota, is facing up to seven years in jail for, firing, for flying a drone over the North Dakota Pipeline protests. In October, Aaron Turgan was arrested by Morton County Police and was charged with a felony count of reckless endangerment, a misdemeanor count of reckless endangerment, and a misdemeanor count of physical obstruction of a government function, according to court documents obtained by Motherboard. Together, he faces up to seven years in court if found guilty. His court case is Thursday. So this came out um, May 25th. He was found now guilty on all court, on all counts. But the reason I bring this up is because uh, with hacktivism or activism, you will, they they're, they always, it always is happening to, particularly with marginalized communities, where they go overboard with all these charges for these different activities. Many of them daily activities that people do on a daily basis and then they just slap these felony charges on them simply because you're doing it against the state. For weeks, Turgan, who also goes by a prolific, prolific the rapper, documented the Dakota, Dakota, the North Dakota Axis Pipeline protests for several Facebook groups that live streamed and posted photos and videos about the movement. Several of these aerial videos documented police shooting protesters with water cannons and tear gas canisters. The case raises important questions about the limitations of the First Amendment 
and the ability for local and state police to enforce laws against drone pilots. The state laws used to arrest Turgan are rarely used to pursue a drone pilot, and airspace safety has typically been enforced by the Federal Aviation Administration, not local law enforcement. In the court document, the state argues that Turgan's drone is a deadly weapon. The offense alleged are acts of violence using a drone as a weapon, careless of the consequences of life and limb of officers and protesters alike. The case hinges on course of whether or not the court believes that Turgan was flying recklessly. We've seen the discrepancy coming up numerous times before. A pilot claims error and complete control of the aircraft, but law enforcement disagrees. Who a judge decides to believe is in this instance when determined by the Turgan spends years in jail or walk free. According to the affidavit signed by the, the Sergeant Shannon Hinkey, uh, Turgan operated the drone 20 to 50 feet above ground or approximately 100 and to, to 150 to 200 protesters there that were unprotected. I approached Turgan and instructed him to land the drone. He did. I attempted to seize the drone from Turgan as evidence was prevented to do so by a group of approximately 24 protesters. He can wrote an affidavit. The reckless operation of the drone by Turgan placed the lives of the protesters and law enforcement on the ground in danger of injury and possible death. He can also wrote that the Turgan flew near a North Dakota Highway Patrol aircraft. A video released by the Morton County Sheriff's Department shows that the drone and the plane stay a considerable distance from each other. Previously, law enforcement in other states have lied about drone encounters with police aircraft. And in filing with the court, the state alleges that if a plane came down as a result of a USA drone, it would have killed those below. In an interview with the Indigenous Life Movement, Turgan said he complied with the officer when he was approached and did not come close to injuring anyone. I have never endangered anybody. I have never tried to do anything wrong. I never flew my drone towards a plane, and having this thread hanging over me is the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life. There are a few things that you should hear. The FAA has made flying over people illegal without a Pacific waiver under its Part 107 regulation, which was released last year. The FAA has handled out, handed out a handful of penalties for pilots operating aircraft in a careless or reckless manner, but those have typically been fines of a couple thousand dollars at most, and no one's gone to prison yet for flying a drone in, inappropriately. For Turgan's being charged under North Dakota state law, not under federal law according to the North Dakota state law, and reckless endangerment is defined broadly as a person who is guilty if he's created a substantial risk of socially bodily injury or death to, in, to another. As any drone operator will tell you, the risk of bodily injury is largely dependent on the flying skills of the pilot, which is likely can't be assessed on the spot by a police officer. Uh, found guilty, it should be the first time I've ever heard of a drone pilot going to jail based on the assessment of a police officer on the ground. The case is partly contentious because during the height of the Dakota Access pipe Pipeline protests last year, the FAA and local police considered to create what many legal experts saw as an illegal no-fly zone designed to keep media from filming police. But local police and federal agencies have been slow to make information about police surveillance and pressure in the protesters public. Several freedom information requests filed by the motherboard and other news outlets have been outright rejected. While FOAA requests by, about the no-fly zone has been delayed several times, it's now two months past the FAA self-imposed deadline. So there you have it. The day against the RM. Uh, this took place July 9th of 2017. Sunday, July 9th is a day against the RM. The documented foundation supports the global campaign led by the SFF to raise awareness of the issues related to the so-called digital rights management software. As any other proprietary technology, the DRM is a killing user's freedom of choice and should always be avoided. Uh, liberal office users are fighting a similar battle when they are propping the ODF standard file format against the OOXML pseudo standard, and, it should be, and that should be against the first to support the day against DRM on social media or by educating their contracts. This is FSF campaign website. Uh, which is uh, defectedbydesign.org, a day against DRM call to action. So this is, you know, part of the week, if you will, about all the shenanigans going on with the internet, and one of them is the DRM. There's something that happened with the W3C, which in regards to DRM, which we will talk about um, after the blackout date on July 12th. And that is it for the news. On to the story uh, a bit of an update, if you will, because we talked about it on our first episode of Word of the Metaverse about net neutrality. So we, before we get started with everything, even though I had covered this on my first episode of A Word from the Metaverse, discussing what was at stake about net neutrality, we're just going to quickly define it. Net neutrality is that all traffic on the internet is equal. Whether you're a small blogger, big blogger, posting pictures about cats, logging onto Twitter, using something like Facebook, or going on Alex, or I think it's called Alila Express to shop, going through Amazon, eBay, posting something about a haiku, or creating your own website, uh, using Bitcoin, going to a Bitcoin website, using a decentralized site where you have to connect first to the internet, get to GitHub so you can download the program. All of that, all that interaction, all that engagement is equal. 
you don't have to pay more to get onto GitHub. You don't have to pay less to get on. You know, don't pay anything to get on Twitter because it's zero rated. You don't have to pay more so you can have a faster uh, connection to net, not only to Netflix, but to, you, that your the movies that you're watching are crystal clear, run on time. There's no spinning wheel, any of that. Everything is equal. And with the repeal, that is not going to occur. So let's, let's get into the episode. So that is net neutrality. That is a basic, basic thing. Everything is the same. Everything is equal. Everything is the same in the sense that everything travels on the internet. And the last episode we read about um, read Aaron Schwartz and how he got involved with SOPA and he explaining how really things don't change unless you get big companies or corporations behind you. He did, he did the analogy about the, the story about John D. Rockefeller supporting Social Security and that's why we have Social Security. And so I'm going to read you the story about uh, from Tech Dirt about Netflix. Now Netflix uh, has stated that they are participating in uh, the July 12th blackout day. But one of the things, even with these major websites that traffic online, is that their bottom line fundamentally is not going to be dramatically, drastically changed because they exist already. They're already big. So they can buy their way through the new tiered system. But we have to kind of frame this and think of this, like for the current generation now that is living, that this... The net neutrality issue, repealing it and having these peer tra- tra- uh, peer systems where you're going to have these different lanes where the traffic is going to go uh, faster if you pay more or connecting more, or if you're doing videos or things of that nature, and splitting and shattering the internet and all these different paid tier types of systems where you have like a, like think of it as a car wash, you can have like the little cheap one where basically you're just running water on your car to the full deluxe wax buff uh scrub it into your um your spinners there and your hubcaps if you will and getting like the hand wash and the the going into uh everything everything is you know buffed by hand and things of that nature uh type of system where you're paying more and getting that thorough clean if you will that type of system that really fundamentally works for a car if you will doesn't work for the internet. That type of system just does not. It's just two totally different type of a feature system. We have to think of it in the sense that you you want a system that exists, this ability to communicate across the globe um, with a click of a button, uh, the ability to connect to you know, be mobile di- devices, desktop, tablets, uh, at your library, at home, uh, at your office, at your business, or just personal. Uh, the ability to connect and communicate and engage and interact and build, if you will, is is not necessary for us. Our protection, its protection, is to the generation to come after us. So they they have the same promise, the same ability to build their own wealth, communicate, and build off of this great platform to whatever fits with that generation, and so on and so forth. So you have to think of it along the lines of like r- well maintained roads or water or a really good overall properly done and maintained infrastructure system where everything works for everybody. Uh, it used to be the case within the states. It used to be in the case where the highways and all our existing infrastructure, like the roads and the bridges and all that stuff, was very well maintained. And it just slowly over time, it just got peeled, 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 peeled away with either budget cuts or going to private corporations and they start using cheap concrete or it, it didn't have the same quality because the the emphasis wasn't on building it for it was building on it for now instead of for later instead of thinking of the present time of the needs of present time but also thinking all right five or ten years from now will this bridge still work or five or ten years from now or 20 years from now will this still bridge still stand something that's going to be lasting and flexible to fit the needs of this generation currently existing but generations afterwards. And that's what we need to think of as, as the, of the internet. Is that something that's going to last for generations on. It's going to our lasting impact on humanity is going to be a, a good thing and continue on forward. Uh, as I like to think of it as a space time community, community, space time, like at any point in one person's existence, they should have the ability to not only connect and communicate on the internet, but have the ability to have every avenue and aspect, the very basic minimum, and then building off to that to the upper level if they choose to, and coming up and creating whatever the next thing may be. But having that basic, basic ABC level, having that basic level of that layer, that the simple layered foundation of entrance 
should be so frictionless that they should be able to engage, dip their toes in, and then build from there and, and, and build whatever they think that is necessary to fit their individual needs or their community needs. And it's very important to protect this now because it's being, the internet is being attacked by so many vectors now from privacy, from surveillance, from corporations taking over so many ac- aspects of this, uh, this platform, uh, the monopolization, uh, you know, totalitarian government, outright totalitarian government, soft totalitarian governments, to even the current democratic, you know, supposed democratic uh, infrastructures, uh, imposing these type of regulations to stifle communication. Because let's face it, the, the, the internet has changed so much of our existing world. Every type of system that exists right now has been touched by the internet and has been dramatically changed from. Many things are ceasing to exist because of the internet, and this scares the crap out of a lot of people. More importantly, for those who seek power, the, the ability to control is not possible for the internet as it currently stands. They try it, they're trying, they're trying. And if we allow them, they'll be able to control and stifle, and then you're going to get you know, your three-channel systems and your the same old, same old that's been happening with humanity. Instead of this very slow awakening and this constant communication, both good and bad and negative, but this constant dialogue this really... I think personally it is tilting. I granted there's a lot of hate speech and, and trolling and uh, fake news and all this a lot of negative stuff, but there's a lot of good stuff that is happening within the internet where people are taking a step back, they're looking at their fellow man for the first time, they're actually engaging them, they're talking to them, they're finding out everything about them, they're building stuff, they're coming up with great concepts and ideas that not only better not only themselves individually, if you want to think in the capitalist system of the buying and selling, but thinking holistically like will my company have a better impact um, on the world will the company i'm building not only provide for my family and my kids you know kids families and for my kids and stuff like that but what am i building will it actually have a positive impact impact on the globe and how can i go about doing that you know do i want to do stuff where you know don't be toxic waste in in the local stream or something like that or do i want to do it do something that's I can build my product in a safe, sound manner by sourcing out that information, by communicating with other people. It may, may take more time, it may take more capital, it may take more effort, but when it's done properly and done well, it's going to not only have that product out there, but have a less of a negative uh, impact globally on, on the world, both environmentally, socially, and things of that nature. And I think you're seeing a lot of that happening and creeping into a lot of these uh, different ideas and projects out there. For example, there's... Um, there's all these social kind of social slash capitalist stuff like Tom shoes where people can buy uh, this pretty kind of decent high, sh- high end shoe called Tom's shoe. And then that shoe um, you're actually by purchasing one of these shoes, you're also paying for a shoe for someone who's less fortunate than yourself. Uh, the raspberry Pi is a great way for people for $34. You can start building your own computer and learning how to code for the most minimalistic, uh, parts, systems, and the ability to connect on the internet on the most cheapest way possible. Uh, there's that laptop that was like, I think it was done by Google. It's like a $100 laptop that are distributed. There's these type of ideas out there that are being done. That, um, primary coming out of the millennial generation, but a little bit on the younger exercise that are, are thinking in that way. And when you start thinking in a positive way, uh, both not only just yourself, but in a global sense, then you're, then you're going to push against people that are like, well, I can build it this way, but I can do it with, you know, slave labor and cheap products and have all this like billion dollars wealth and have my Lamborghini and screw those poor people type of idea mentality that's been going on for ever and forever and ever. And I think not only that, but also the fact that people are, because of the internet and their ability to connect and communicate, they're becoming more educated. And when you have an educated populace, you, it's not possible to manipulate them as much and have some control or sway. Granted, in the States, the 2016 election, <laughs> that wasn't our best moment here in the States. But I think what you're seeing, the reaction, like with France and other countries having their own elections and what happened with uh, the English election where there's not even a, uh, a single party in control. There, there's not even a because uh, they're a parliamentary system where they can even have um, 
alliances and to have a, a, you know control within their government it's kind of really like very narrowly split or, um, or they're saying they might even have, have end up having another election is a direct result of oh i wasn't paying attention but now i am and i'm going to do all this research and start communicating and talking with people and seeing what's going on in my country but what's going on in the other worlds and particularly i guess france is the best example when it comes to fake news and manipulation and uh, things of that nature where people try to, to manipulate all different parties the manipulation that goes on in elections is being more obvious and transparent and people are seeing the jig if you will but fundamentally what i'm saying is when you have an educated populace you can't deceive or trick or fool them as much they're going to be hesitant they're going to think things through they're going to start um, applying their critical thinking skills and the internet is one of the most effective tools out there that allows people to have that ability uh, I say I say the second effective tool is a library system, but I would say a library system and an internet system, there's combinations of two, having a strong library system and a strong internet infrastructure allows for a very strong educated populace. It's not necessarily having a university system or even a strong public system, but having the ability to access your information at will uh, and not in some kind of like with a school system where it's all very subject-based, but what you are passionate or interested in or just simply want to know and go as in-depth as you need to and, and narrow down to the brass tac tactics to that information, uh, the Internet has the, the, by far of all the information dispensing tools out there has been the best mechanisms to do that. And with net neutrality, it's going to slow and hamper that. It's going to hamper communication. It's going to hamper in, in, innovation. It's going to hamper the people to communicate. And it's going to hamper a lot of social causes that a lot of people for, whether you're being like, I'm, because I'm American, like if you're on the right or the left or a Tea Party or a liberal or Occupy or Black Lives Matter movement, the ability for people to socialize and interact and engage and combat their social wrongs or their perceived social wrongs or actual social wrongs within their society is not going to be uh, as powerful or as amplified or to have the effective change of government or redresses, if you will, is not going to occur to the degree that has been occurring within the last 10 years. And a lot of that has to do with the internet and the rise of social media. That's because of the internet. The social media is built off of the internet infrastructure and that communication tool uh, has allowed for a lot of you know, innovation and movement and technology, other technology innovations, connections, medical discoveries, all sorts of wonderful things have come out of it. And now they're seeking to repeal this. So I'm going to read some of these articles here. So about Netflix, again, by Carl Boat. So net neutrality. Uh, Netflix admits it doesn't really care about net neutrality now that it's big. So if you've been watching the Trump administration's attempt to kill the net neutrality, you've probably noted that one-time net neutrality supporter Google and Netflix have been notably absent from the debate, leaving small companies and consumers outgunned and outspent in the attempt to protect the rules. If you're a regular tech dirt reader, you recall that despite still favoring her reputation as a consumer ally, Google hasn't really given much of a damn about protecting net neutrality since around 2010 or so. Its interest waned even further once the company launched its own ISP, Google Fiber. Netflix booming disinterest in the subject has been more of a recent affair. In a recent letter to shareholders, the company made it clear that it believes that now it's an international video powerhouse fighting for things like an open and healthy internet and level playing fields are no longer a priority. Weakening of the U.S. net neutrality laws should that occur as likely to material effect on our, our domestic margins or service quality because we're now popular enough with consumers to keep our relationship with ISB stable. And while some tried to argue that this was simple, simply Netflix trying to calm nervous investors, it's become clear that Netflix's apathy goes quite a bit deeper. Speaking at a conference in California this week, uh, CEO Reed Hastings stated that while net neutrality is still important, it's normally less important to the company now that it's a big freaking deal. It's not nearly important to, to us because we're big enough to get the deals we want, Hastings said. It was candid admission that no matter what the FTC decided to do with Title II, Netflix isn't worried about its ability to survive. Hastings says that Netflix is weighing it weighing it in against changing the current rules, but it's not our primary battle at the point, and we don't have a special vulnerability to it. We might recall that Netflix was swinging a very diff singing a very different tune a few years ago when reports began to emerge that giant S ISPs like Verizon, ATA, Comcast, and Charter were intentionally letting their internet connection points congest in order to kill settlement-free peering and extract additional 
duplicate tolls from content and trans transit companies. The moves resulted in a notable slowdown of Netflix, Netflix subscribers, who were quick to blame Netflix for problems originating at the ISP. The New York AG's recent lawsuit against Charter for slowing speeds included some internal emails supporting the allegations. The FCC's 2015 net neutrality rules did especially prohibit this kind of chicanery, uh, chicanery, but they did allow the FCC to investigate anti-competitive behavior on the on the front on a case-by-case basis, and lo and behold, the mere presence in the world did appear to magically resolve many of these disputes. But Netflix also had the cash on hand necessary to pay large ISPs like Comcast for direct inter interconnection and options some other companies may not have the luxury to do. And of course, that's just a thing. Net neutrality may not matter to Netflix now that it's big enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with companies like Verizon and Comcast, but it's still damn important for the Netflix of tomorrow, companies that will be forced to do business over already uncompetitive broadband networks as an access moves over nearly all meaningful consumer protections. Hastings' message to these emerging entrepreneurs, basically to figure out for themselves because Netflix done got theirs. The Trump FCC is going to unwind the rules no matter what anybody says, Hastings argues. He might believe that net neutrality is important for society, but his company Netflix isn't in trouble, so it's not going to get into the fight. We had to carry the water when we were growing up and we were small, Hastings says, and other companies have to be on that leading edge. Uh, that vicious short-sighted cited uh Hastings is basically saying that keeping the internet healthy, level, and open is no longer his problem. Granted, there are several things driving his uh, this enormous propagation, including said interconnection deals and the fact that Netflix recently secured a deal with Comcast, bringing Netflix to Comcast cable boxes. So in Hastings' mind, he's moved beyond the net neutrality because the company was, was large and wealthy enough to pay for the luxury to temporarily resolve the threat problem solved. But Hastings is dead wrong. As we move to strip all oversight of the uncompetitive broadband sector, the door will be will be reopened to ISPs finding a litany of creative ways to abuse the lack of co competition. That's going to get easier to do as cable providers grab a growing monopoly over fixed line broadband, expanded arbitrary and unnecessary use, usage caps, and using zero rating to drive users away from competing services. If Hayes thinks a visually uncompetitive broadband sector with zero regulatory oversight is well for anybody not, not named AT and T, Verizon, Comcast, and Verizon. And and Verizon, he's fooling himself, and is anybody else sharing his sentiment? Sure, Hastings was clear that Netflix was still technically supporting net neutrality, but only via the occasional tersely worded press release from lobbying and policy vessels. But if consumers are looking for real help in defending net neutrality, it's abundantly clear they need to start looking elsewhere, because Netflix now believes it's somehow above having to care about silly stuff like the internet fucking working properly. So America's net neutrality wages hits academia. Uh, this is from the Register. Corporate Shill Allegations Sparks Furious Response by Kieran McCarthy. A special report in extraordinary flurry of allegations, personal insults, and legal threats, new net neutrality has entered the world of academia. At the heart of the row is a new paper in the International Journal of Communication that claims to act as a rebuttal to an earlier paper that had been reportedly cited by the chairman of America's federal regulator, the FCC, as justification for tearing up the existing net neutrality rules. The new paper alleges that far from being an independent analysis, the original paper was commissioned by an advocacy group funded by the cable industry and that its authors have effectively acted for the cable industry for years and that the claim at the heart of the paper that there are no economic analysis behind the net, net neutrality rules is bunkum. When the authors contacted the other paper's authors as well as the group behind the funding, the paper to put their claims to them for response, they were un understandably upset. Within days, the editor of the IGOC received a slew of letters and legal threats telling him not to publish the paper due to his false and misleading defamatory assertions and claimed they would provide a basis for liability in the event of a reckless publication. Open letters flung the same dirt at the reporter's authors, raising questions about their funding, questions, specific claims in the papers, alleging that they were com uh, compromised due to the relationship with other groups that are pro-net neutrality. Despite the not so subtle legal threats, the IOJC went ahead with the publication, accompanied by no fewer than three responses from the the grief. Such was the intensity in the argument that the IGOC also published it as a feature rather than an article and added a disclaimer that the paper did not reflect the IJOC the IJOC views. Upshot. So far the new paper has attracted nine responses, and the upshot, as with most things surrounding the case against net neutrality, is that the increasingly partisan nature of the net neutrality debate is forcing everyone in one of two camps. To determine the informed debate. Most well, strikingly, the fact that the original paper, the curious absence of economic analysis at the Federal Communication Commission, an agency in search of a mission, has been used by anti-net neutrality advocates and the chair of the Federal Communications 
uh, Ajit Pai as evidence why the open internet order needs to be struck down as pushed it into the anti-camp and so open it up to critical attack. We spoke with one of the authors of the original paper, Hal Sittinger, and he told us he never expected his paper to become part of an angry swirl around net neutrality. Singer sits in the unwelcome middle of the net neutrality debate, not happy with the Title II classification that the open in- in- internet order imposes on telecos, but equally unhappy with the hands-off approach advocated by the chair, Pi. Something P- Pi insists is merely a soft-touch regulation. Singer ag- advocates for the neutral fact-finder approach used by the FCC to adjudicate claims on discrimination by independent cable networks against virtually integrated cable operators. I'm not in the Pi camp, I'm not in the Winston camp, he adds, referring to Dwayne Winston who co-authored the new paper that attacks Singer's paper as the product of a cable industry behind-the-scenes effort. Singer also believes that the, that the common uh, carriage aspect of the Title II is useful, but that the reality is that the 1932 law used to ground the current net neutrality rule is widely out of date and so not fit for the purpose. The sheer amount that they had to forbear, forbear is effectively an admission that is not the right fit, he told us, referring to the fact that the FCC effectively gutted the original law to attach it to telecos. The intent of, the, of the, his original article, Singer argues, was to point out that the FCC does not use sufficient economics, in particular cost-benefit analysis, to make decisions. In fact, to impress on whether it had carried out a cost-benefit analysis in arriving at the open internet order, the FCC at the time responded correctly that it didn't have to. The agency, uh... That's because I like executive agencies under control of the White House that are expected to do such analysis. The FCC is semi-autonomous. Singer says he was approached by Cal Innovates and asked if he would co-author a piece digging into the lack of economic analysis at the FCC. And being an economist, he said yes. Our, our article traces the history of economic analysis at the FCC from its peak in the 1990s to the virtual disappearance in recent history. Reads the response from Singer and co-author Gerald uh, Fallherb and Augustus, your social, the new IJOC paper attacking their work. It continues, what our article does not do is comment, criticize, or in any way analyze the substantive issues subject to the orders, i.g. network network neutrality. But of course, it's just an academic paper arguing for better economics at the FCC. There wouldn't have been the explosion, been the explosion we've seen with this new paper. Singer admits that the white paper originally contained a large section on net neutrality, in particular when the FCC then chief economist Tim Berner said was was an economics free zone when it comes to the open internet order. Berner has freely expressed his regret and chagrin over the comment that he says was part of a self deprecated joke I told to diffuse attention at a small but contentious conference on the FCC open net internet order, but with but which has become a constant refrain and battering ram usually used by anti-net neutrality advocates. However, the paper of the white paper dealing, dealing, dealing with the net neutrality was pulled out of Singer's paper before it was published in the IJOC, leaving it largely about the lack of economic analysis at the FCC. The funder. Uh, the new IJOC paper that has caused the current wave of the furious denunciations and, and implicit knowledge has much and largely focused on what it sees as the precarious influence of the big cable, in this case to Cal Innovates. Weisnick and its co-author, Jeffrey Pooley, described Cal Innovate as an advocacy group with deep ties to the telecommunication industry, and they note that a reference to the fact that the paper was funded by Cal uh, Innovates was removed before publication. Why and how that happened remains unresolved. Cal Innovates described itself as a nonpartisan coalition of tech companies, founders, funders, and nonprofits to determine to, to make the new economy a reality, but among its members, almost all of whom will never have heard of, like, Drumby, uh, Van Gogh and Speak sits an unusual giant, AT&T. So I'm going to kind of skip around here and get to the conclusion here. And so where are we? In short, the new paper tears out the lid to what everyone knows is going on behind the scenes. Careful cable funding of third parties to push a position and then carefully pointing of others to that position is a way of ta- taking control of the debate. That Weissick and Pulley decided to be so aggressively has sparked an equally aggressive response. Those sat in the middle are uncomfortable at the effort to push or pull them into one or two camps. Does it matter? Sadly, just like the split in the wider United States, yes it does. The stakes could be no higher, the paper argues, as Pi sprints to reverse the most prominent accomplishment of the Obama-era FCC. It continues that the IGJOC paper and its predecessor are touchstones for the op-eds across the think tanks and their blogs, as well as the business and popular press. Pi has positioned the paper as a cornerstone of his rush to roll back FCC regulation. The authors appeal to the authority of economics, as well as document in some detail, 
coax a full-throated political project designed to remake communication markets along the lines that incumbent telecommunications, broadband internet, and media industries have desired all along. And that sadly looks like an entirely true statement. So basically, you know, these think tanks on both sides are funding different policy papers to try to push the dialogue their way. And it's, I guess you could say, it's causing a bit of a a tizzy in the academic um, world on the subject of net neutrality. So here's a poll uh, that Mozilla did, and they published on their blog. Uh, came out June 6 of 2017. Uh, the news out, the new Mozilla poll, Americans from both political parties overwhelmingly support net neutrality. Our survey also reveals that a majority of Americans do not trust the government to protect internet access. There's something that Americans of very politi- political affiliations, Democrat, Republicans, and Independents, largely agree, the need to protect net neutrality. A recent opinion poll carried out by Mozilla and uh, IPSOSS revealed overwhelming support across party lines for net neutrality. With over three quarters of Americans, 76% support net neutrality. 81% of Democrats and 73% of uh, Republicans are in favor of it. Another key finding, most Americans do not trust the U.S. government to protect access to the Internet. 70% of Americans place no trust or little trust in the Trump administration or Congress to do so. That's 78%. Uh, Mozilla and Osmos carried out the poll in late May on the heels of the SEC vote to begin dismantling the Obama era net neutrality rules. Uh, we polled approximately 1,000 American adults across the U.S., a sample that included three, 30, 354 Democrats, 344 Republicans, and 224 Independents. At Mozilla, we believe net neutrality is integral to the health, healthy Internet and enables Americans to say, watch and make what they want online without meddling or interference from the ISPs, internet service providers such as AT&T, Verizon, and Time Warner. Net neutrality is fundamental to free speech, competition, innovation, and choice online. As you, you may have seen, the FCC have proposed rolling back net neutrality protections that were enacted in 2015 and will collect public comments on net neutrality through August 18th. And hopefully drawing on these comments, the FCC will vote whether to adopt the order and strip their ability to create net neutrality rules. In the coming months, Mozilla will continue to work with the majority of Americans to endorse net neutrality. We will directly engage with the key policymakers. We will continue our advocacy work, like our net neutrality petitions, which has garnered more than 100,000 signatures and over 50 hours of voicemail messages for the FCC, just a few of the almost 5 million comments on the order. And Mozilla will participate on the July 12th day of action, join the fight for the future, free press and demand progress, and others to call for the internet users to defend net neutrality. Below, more key findings from the poll. The respondents across the political spectrum, 78%, believe that equal access to the internet is a right, with large majorities of Democrats, 88%, independents, 71%, and Republicans, 67% in agreement. The respondents have little trust in the government institutions to protect their access to the internet. The highest levels of distrust were reported for the top administration, 70%, Congress, 78%, and the FCC, 58%. When it comes to the corporate, corporations protecting access to the internet, 54% of the respondents distrust ISPs. Americans view net neutrality as having a positive impact on most of the society, and respondents said it is a good thing for small businesses, 70%, individuals, 69%, innovators, 65%, ISPs, 55%, but fewer think it will benefit big business, 52 uh, And then they have a list of even further breakdown of the different type of questions they ask and the breakdown there. Of, um, here. So there is that. And here is the... Uh, an article by The Wire. Uh, Kill the open internet and wave goodbye to the consumer choice. So, the net neutrality debate can seem complicated, but at its heart, the issue rests on two simple realities. First, for more than a decade, the status quo in the U.S. has been an open internet that supports thriving innovation among websites, apps, and new digital services. Second, innovators and consumers are dependent on a few large broadband providers to serve as gatekeepers to the internet. Pressures on these broadband com- companies to, to deliver better options prices, prices for consumers is already vanishing small. The true, even, mo- in, even in mobile broadband, where the presence of four nationwide carriers continue to deliver better results in the form of unlimited data plans and other options. In 2015, the FCC adopted its open internet order to guarantee that consumers aren't blocked or manipulated when they use their broadband connections and ensure that competition from the internet isn't artificially squelched. The two goals work hand-in-hand hand because residential broadband connections are the pathways on which consumers travel to the modern world and through which the content and service of the internet reaches residential users. 
Two years later, the new majority of the FCC has announced that it intends to undo the 2015 order. That includes the prohibition on blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization. But the FCC also proposed eliminating the general conduct rule, which protects competition. The FCC would be mistaken to unravel a bipartisan approach that has worked. Since the Bush administration, both Republican and Democratic FCC chairs have emphasized that they would take action to protect the open Internet, and they have done so. Like a police officer keeping a watchful eye at the busy intersection, the FCC presence has both stopped and deterred harm to consumers' competition and innovation. The threat to the open Internet is real because competition in U.S. Broad mar- broadband markets is limited to the extent that it exists at all. About 90 million U.S. household subscribers to the kind of broadband that runs on wires to their homes. The two top four providers, two cable and two telecom, together claim three quarters of all residential consum- customers. So right there, that is the biggest issue is we probably need to start breaking up uh, these ca- cable companies and tele companies and not allow them to merge. I think there was like what Time Warner became Spectrum and merged with something. I think it was Verizon. And that's not even really a down deal. Yeah, you, you just need to start breaking people up, breaking them up just like they did Ma Bell and just keep breaking and breaking and breaking until we get a free market competitive system and maybe start building some really decentralized internet infrastructure so that we're not solely dependent on these ISPs. Of course, consumers can only choose among the broadband networks that reach them. Roughly 21% of U.S. census blocks had no high-speed landline broadband provider and 37% only had one option. This is no choice at all. For download data at 100 megabytes, 88% of the country has either no option or just one provider. In rural America, it's much worse. More than half of rural census blocks have no choice of high-speed broadband provider, which condemns them to slow speeds for any service they get. Even where there are choices, the FCC has found that consumers face significant costs in switching between broadband providers. Moreover, broadband providers have the ability to target content creators selectively, making it harder for consumers to understand why they're having trouble accessing certain content, like throttling Netflix that occurred a couple years ago, and YouTube. So it's clear that most U.S. consumers depend upon a few big players in order to access the Internet. Therefore, the critical question is whether these companies have the incentive and ability to harm consumers and competition, and that is, are they motivated to control what kinds of innovation come to consumers? And do they have the tools to do so? Both in the FCC and the Department of Justice have recognized in recent procedures the answers are yes and yes. Broadband providers have the power and the motivation to curb any competition that uses their network in order to reach consumers. And we know that eliminating competition via mergers, for example, risks consumers paying higher prices and receiving lower quality products and service. It doesn't seem like a coincidence that the so-called new golden age of TV has flourished in a time when Amazon, Hulu, and Netflix and other services are producing popular award-winning shows in direct competition with more established players. Here's why that's a, there's a problem. The big broadband companies also supply video programming, which means that these firms' revenues are directly threatened when consumers use their broadband connection to access competing video providers. The incentive for broadband companies to discriminate against online video providers will only grow stronger as the market becomes more competitive. It was recently, and it was recently with the arrival of services that carried live television channels just like the traditional cable operators. Well, it might be just that we might have to say that you're just a cable company and that you can't create content. Because it seems that there's a significant conflict there. And I know that that is done with certain industries where you can't, I forgot what it's called, it's been such a long time. It's like vertical integration, I think it's called. I'm not going to look it up right now. But I do know with when it comes to movies, um, like Sony can't own a movie chain. You can't have uh, Sony movie chains. That's why there's the the theater systems are so big and divergent and yes there's even monopolies in within them but they're not actually owned by like paramount or uh warner brothers or uh, sony or anything like that they're not allowed to own their own um theater system they have to distribute they can distribute but they can't own the theater itself and that's allowed for competition and allows for you, you to go to a movie theater and see Sony, Warner Brothers, and Paramount, and all these different um, theaters, um, different movies from different companies in a movie theater. Versus if it was just Sony, then you would just see just Sony movies. Um, and maybe that's my, my, what it might come down to. When reviewing the proposed and ultimately failed merger of Comcast and Time, that's what it was, Time Warner Cable, Economics said the Department of Justice concluded that the merger's firm power will likely reduce competition in the video and broadband markets, leaving consumers with fewer choices, higher prices, and lower quality. And when the Department of Justice considered a proposed and ultimately successful merger of Chatter Communication 
and Time Warner Cable. That's what became um, Spectrum. It recognized the ability of cable and telephone companies to take action against new video competition and limit the new company's ability to seek terms in programming contracts that would harm online video providers. Some argue that using traditional antitrust rules can get the same same job done and just as well. While the two of us both believe strongly in the importance of antitrust enforcement, those laws cannot duplicate the kind of respective intercity-wide rules contained in the 2015 Open Internet Order. And Scream Justice Anthony Kennedy faced pre precisely th this argument when he wrote the majority opinion in a Supreme Court case upholding requirements that cable systems carry broadcast stations. He wrote that the regulation could be preferred to antitrust because of the considerable expense of delay inherent in antitrust litiga litigation and the great disparity in the wealth and sophistication between TV stations and cable systems, as well as the burden of bringing a case which would require considerable expense of delay. All this is even more true of the speech between large broadband providers and their customers. That's why open -net internet rules make sense. They just they let the industry know what, what is required while giving consumers an avenue of relief at the FCC that doesn't require long and expensive antitrust litigation. I think they can do both. I can maybe they have an open internet and start antitrust in these companies. The economic facts are telling, but that's not all. Consumers should be able to use their broadband connections to access the lawful content of their choosing. The FCC is reconsidering whether broadband providers should be given the new freedom to block or interfere with the ability of consumers to express their thoughts or to listen to views that they want to hear. And that, that's the kind of free speech on which America was built. In 1776, Thomas Paine didn't need the permission of any other content creator or distributor to circulate common sense. But without rules prohibiting blocking, throttling, and like, broadband providers will gain the power to limit what unpopular content flows over the networks to, deter, to the detriment of consumers and dem democracies. Our challenger to the 2015 Open Internet Order argued exactly this to the DC, D.C. Circuit, that the rules violated the right to block legal but unpopular content. An open internet has worked for America, creating a virtuous circle of innovation, trust, adoption, and further innovation. The circle should not be broken. So yeah, um, as I was opening at the top, it's, it's important to keep the open internet, and maybe we need to also, as a since the internet is set, in and of itself is being attacked on all so many fronts, to maybe start pushing for antitrust legislation against um, these ISPs and start breaking them up, or start saying, hey, you can't also be a content producer and a cable writer. You need to choose one or the other. Are you a content producer or are you a cable writer? Are you, are you providing the internet or are you creating the internet, but you can't be both? And maybe that's what eventually is going to come if we're going to have a free market and open market system. But more importantly, we need to start allowing for more broadband companies, whether it be allowing for cities and counties or even states themselves to start building out their own networks or allowing for more uh, companies to come in and, and do this it, or finding a, an inventive way of allowing for people to connect where they might not necessarily need to be ground wiring which is the biggest biggest hurdle but allowing for uh, wireless towers or, or some other so there are other things that the ISPs are doing besides trying to get the government to repeal uh, net neutrality and so here's one of the things that they're doing <clears throat> So ISPs are no longer even bothering to provide bogus excuses for the expanding use of bullshit usage caps. This is from TechDirt, uh, written by Carl Bode. A few years ago, large ISPs began taking advantage of a lack of competition in the broadband market by imposing arbitrary, unnecessary, and confusing usage caps and overage fees. Initially, these companies tried to claim that this was necessary to manage congestion on their networks, which is bullshit. As data emerged, it, data emerged in the end of this claim is bullshit, large ISPs were ultimately forced to acknowledge as much and back away from the claim. But this hasn't stopped them from doing the practice. It's economics. It has nothing to do with technology in and of itself. Shortly after that, ISPs instead began claiming that these glorified price hikes were necessary as a simple matter of fairness, and that the industry native narrative du jour became that it has only made sense that heavy users should pay more money to broad for broadband. Uh, this is not, when it comes to the internet, it's not like water or gas or utilities where, excuse me, where there's a finite, pro finite property or the fact that if you utilize too much electricity, you can cause blackouts or trigger anything like that, where it's more of an infrastructure usage. Or even with gas or water, you can run out or eventually cause like droughts or over usage could cause droughts and uh, congested certain areas. With the internet, that that is not the case. It's just a bunch of bullshit. So the excuse was bullshit too. Americans already pay some of the highest prices for broadband 
of any developed nation under the flat rate pricing model, which any larger large ISP earning report will show you is perfectly profitable. And if excessive concept, consumption really was a problem, it was a problem closed, caused solely by a small number of users that could easily be shoved towards business class tiers. It didn't require saddling everyone with confusing and expensive surcharges. These days, after being hammered for years for bogus justifications, large ISPs no longer even provide a reason for these rate hikes. Take Cox Communication, for example. The company was, has quietly announced it would be expanding usage caps into several new markets, changing, charging users $10 per each additional 50 gigabytes of data users consume over a 1 terabyte limit. The email being sent to users, which is getting widespread attention on Reddit, doesn't even really bother to offer a justification for the price hike. Not only that, but another thing that's happening is uh, ISPs are suing various states and counties and cities that seek to build their own broadband infrastructure so that their population and their businesses locally have the ability to connect to the internet, communicate, and compete. Uh, several new silent reporters, reporters, including myself, tried to get Cox to explain his reasons for the hikes, and the couple tried to hack it while it's able to slowly join a girl monopoly next gen broad broad telecoms telecom to keep a great level. The end was supposed to be all the changes to the same service, but help it the ISP on the extremely competitive competitor. Zero rated service while still penalizing their competitors like now that they are taking a bit of eventual working for um with a zero net rating thing with uh, T-Mobile. I guess if you use Pandora, it doesn't go against your data. You use the title. It forces people, if they have a T-Mobile service, to get Pandora, which could eventually be bought by your T-Mobile service. So, certain set of apps that you normally would download for free, and maybe you have a membership fee, will get all into your to your um, mobile service, and that money is going to go to T-Mobile, and not necessarily directly, completely with Pandora because they they have a deal with the zero ratings, so they're going to kick some of that profit to T-Mobile, and it's just it's anti-competitive, it's mon- monopolistic. And the concept of the whole like building infrastructure issue has changing with wireless and technology to the point where it's not really necessary completely to put so many lines down, necessary or fiber optic cables. You can do much of this through ISPs and, and, and different means. And there was one thing that Google, I guess, was trying to do. I'm not sure it was Google or Apple, but somebody was trying to do is uh, take the existing telephone lines and put a bunch of wireless um, uh, devices on it so that they can send signals off and build off the already existing uh, infrastructure to uh, allow people to connect the Internet, which would be great for uh, rural areas where they can't get the, that fiber off the cable. So you, you hit these uh, wire, like a tire, like miles and miles of, wireless connections all connecting back to that you know that broadband connection that might be 10 or 20 miles away and get into the internet and still have like high high speed and high interaction uh because they're, they're all clustered together almost in like a, a mesh net type of a system that is getting challenged by these uh, uh not only by the telephone companies themselves but by isps as well and it's it's just very it the whole system needs to be really, really overhaul in general but here we go but fear not cox did tell some news outlets that the company would soon be letting users avoid the caps and subscribe to an unmannered connection for an added unspecified cost. In other words, if you don't want to pay us more money for the exact same service, please pay us more money for the exact same service. Why? Because we can and regulators care, can care less. Whenever the conversation about broadband caps pops up, many people quickly get bogged down in the debate on whether or not a terabyte is fair, losing sight of the fact that these limits are utterly unnecessary and we wouldn't be seeing them at all in a healthy competitive market. What's deemed fair today won't necessarily be fair in the multi-user 4K streaming household of tomorrow. And what, without competitive pressure, there's nothing ensuring that these caps scales with use. In fact, ISPs are incentivized to tighten the news further once you agree to have your usage metered. And with the current uh, Ajit Pai led FCC clearly intent to turn a blind eye to both a lack of competition and the predatory behavior that results from it by violations of privacy or net neutrality, there's plenty more anti-competitive shenanigans and evil adjusted nonsense waiting in the wings. And then I have a, a couple of different articles where uh, the lobbying wings of these ISPs are uh, buying anti-net peers as sponsored results which usually search for topics involving net neutrality. The ad appears with the title Support Net Neutrality, Promote Broadband Innovation and links it to a page <coughs> on the BFA site dealing with net neutrality. The landing page of the advertising contains a number of talking points that opposes net neutrality in the current form which has classified the internet as a public utility under Title II of the Communication Act. FCC Chairman uh, Ajit Pai introduced his plan to undo those protections, which has received the support of a number of major telecom- telecommunication companies. 
Title II is not net neutrality. One bullet point on the site says, before explaining that net neutrality is not controversial, but the classifying internet service providers as common carriers under the 1930s air utility regulation is. It also says the regulations deter investment in network and put internet r- jobs at risk. If Silicon Valley used these rules, Apple would still be stuck in the garage and Google would just be the wrong way to spell a really big number, the site argued. What is not clear on the site is who's funding the message, and the BFA counts among its members AT&T, Charter, Comcast, the Telecommunication Industry Association, and the Internet and Television, Television Association, formerly known as the National Cable and Tele- Telecommunication Association. The trade organization that backed BFA also composed of major wired and wireless internet providers and have dumped considerable resources into the BFA. The ITA gave more than $10 million to the BFA between 2010 and 2014, and a 2012 donation of $2 million accounted for more than half of the BFA's $3.5 Five million budget that year. In 2014, during the original debate over, on, over whether the FCC should classify the internet as a public utility, the BFA was criticized by a number of small companies that counted among its members for essentially tricking them and joining anti-net neutrality organizations. Other companies listed by the BFA as members said they have never heard of the group. The advertisement for the BFA are the latest efforts by organizations to support undoing current net neutrality protections to, to push their voice to the forefront of the debate. Earlier this week, the FBA, FCC reported it was hit by uh, DDoS attacks or distributed denial of service attacks that took its commenting system offline. The flood of traffic came just after John Oliver encouraged viewers of the, of the HBO show last week tonight to leave comments on the FCC site encouraging the agency to keep current net neutrality protections. Once the comment system was once again online and accessible, it appeared an automated bot was leaving thousands of comments advocating for the reversal of, of the Title II protection. The bot used names and addresses of people that appeared to be sourced from real estate websites. Uh, so yeah, they're using false names. They're taking companies that have no association or a discontinued association with this, and basically lying, saying that they have a much larger group. Uh, this article is written by uh, AJ Dillinger and came out May fifth of, uh, of the uh, May eleventh of this year. But this has been very consistent. There's a number of different articles I have uh, linked in the show notes about this, about these lobbying groups. Basically tricking and trying to confuse people on the issue of net neutrality to try to garner or gain support or push legislation into their direction. And that's pretty much going to wrap up uh, this portion of the episode. It's just that, you know, net neutrality is necessary for a fully functioning Internet. And if you're going to have these tiered systems, you're, the Internet as we know it, it being an open source, uh, open to anyone, open to create, open to do anything will cease to exist, it's going to slow down, it's going to get bottlenecked, and it's just going to be garbage. There's so many other systems that are in existence right now that are just like that. And it has really nothing to do with like regulation, but more to do with crony capitalism and corruption to benefit either one industry over another or one company over another or a series of companies over another to prevent anti-competitiveness and not truly have a free market type of system. With the way the internet is as its current state, it's very much free market. If you have a great website, if you have a great idea, if you build it well, if you build a community, you can garner attention, uh, sell your product, uh, sell yourself, if you will, like on YouTube or Twitter or blogs or Twitch or any of those types of uh, sites. Uh, utilizing social media, it happens all the time from SD sellers to eBay sellers, build up and become something. Even eBay itself becoming like a the catch-all uh sell your stuff out of your garage on the online to a very major e-commerce site, Amazon, all these different businesses. And some of them have grown and become big and turn into things that particularly Amazon, they're not the best thing, but there's so many other worthwhile uh, investments and ideas and projects and foundations and blogs and just everything on the internet, the, the ability to communicate, to connect, be so disruptive, so oppressive that it will be, just very, very hard. Just think of all the different social movements, the, the discoveries, the knowledge that people have garnered really within the last 25 years. The more people, kids these, to these days know more about the world around them than their parents, their grandparents, their great parents. Even the, their grandparents or great grandparents, for most of them, that jumped out of planes and, you know, either to Korea, Vietnam, or, uh, World War II. That's always talked about. You know the lat. You know the the great generation. They jumped out of planes. You know their high school senior year or whatever, and got to see the world, and they encountered and engaged different people, if you will. Credit it was through warfare. Uh, kids can do that now with a click of a button, where they can actually engage and talk to a person their own age on the other side of the country, have dialogues with people about something as simple as you know Naruto or Pokemon or 
uh, any subject or about knitting and connecting with people and finding out about different cultures, different societies, uh, demystifying and and making it making the world more accessible for them, which makes them a far more well-rounded person. They're less fearful of other people. When someone says some, you know, something like, uh, you know, the Earth is flat. You know, you see that kind of joke thing. But there's people out there that still believe the Earth is flat. They can counter like those false claims with a click of their button. I've seen I have younger siblings. I've seen them do this when when adults say something and they just really do a really quick Google search and they do a couple Google searches, go beyond the first page and like read up and go, oh no, that's a lie. That's that's not true. And counter that adult's argument and have a conversation. Kind of get yelled at a little bit because they're teenagers and stuff. But say no, that claim's not true. It's a false story or that that's not a fact anymore. This is what re- is really going on. And it, I think it's very important and very engaging. Now for Build Your Own. Here I have a combination of two uh, projects that I've spoken about in the past and we'll go in and get on actually both Raspberry Pi, um, I'm on a grocery shop, I'm going to do a review of that, as well as VPN uh, servers, particularly with the, the announcement that Proton Mail made and the fact that they have a VPN that is available free for everyone, as well as a uh, I'm there's no doubt a paid uh, extra service. I, again, I'm going to be looking into all of that. But <clears throat> so here is a Pi My Life up that has an article called Raspberry Pi VPN Server Builds Your Own Pri- Virtual Private Network and How You Can Go About and Doing That. And there's something I've been using, which is very fascinating with the whole concept of journalistic and medical or all these type of journals where you can do research and using AIs or using open source material or getting these journals out of paywalls into the open uh, is called FuseMind. It's a Google Chrome extension. It's smarter, search faster research, discover more than just a paper. FuseMind prototype. Uh, so this, I'm just going to read a little bit about it. Uh, for now, FuseMind works closely with papers held by uh, Arvix and PubMed. This means that we would cover biomed, life science, physics, math, and comp, uh, computer science. If your field isn't on the list, we collect it here and we'll add it ASAP to score. We're using an AI to develop a personalized paper relevance metric and soon developing an innovative and tailored academic search experience. For now, you can benefit from the altimetric attention score and a great measure of research and impact. Our position works exclusively on top of Google Scholar, uh, PubMed, and ARX, uh, ARXIV, or Arvix search. If there's any other sites you believe that we should be looking into covering, let us know. So basically what it is, is that you uh, can search something using this search engine, and it allows you to have an understanding of where the paper's at, how it's distributed, uh, what people think about it from Reddit to Twitter to anything of that nature, and you can uh, find out more kind of down and gritty details about uh, particular papers, subject matters, things of that nature, and you can find well what it is you're clicking on. Is it uh, very relevant to what you're looking at? Uh, do you need to go even deeper? Do you need to go somewhere else? I'm going to read a little bit more here from so from Fuse My Mission to Accelerate Discovery and Creating Knowledge. With over 50,000 new research papers published every week, finding relevant ones has become increasingly challenging. Giving students and researchers the ability to efficiently find those papers that truly matter to them. We believe it's a paramount to the making of a better world, with better access to better information. The great minds of our generation can create better solutions faster. By reducing the, paper, paper, by reducing the barriers that prevent people from discovering knowledge, we hope to inspire more and more people to become a part of the scientific process that derives the world. What gets us up in the morning is the thought of a university student in a rural and isolated region being able to discover new and important knowledge at the same rate as a Stanford or Cambridge student. We're really excited and honored to have the opportunity to help drive the next wave of scientific discovery. So fuse mine. Now for Build Your Own. Here I have a combination of two uh, projects that I've spoken about in the past, and we'll go in depth on actually both of them, um, Raspberry Pi, um, I'm on a grocery shop, I'm going to do a review of that, as well as VPN uh, servers, particularly with the, the announcement that Proton Mail made and the fact that they have a VPN that is available free for everyone, as well as, a, uh, I'm no doubt, a paid uh, extra service. I, again, I'm going to be looking at it. But, <clears throat> so here is a Pi My Life Up has an article 
called Raspberry Pi VPN Server, Build Your Own Pri- Virtual Private Network, and how you can go about and doing that. And then something I've been using, which is very fascinating with the whole concept of journalistic and uh, medical, all these type of journals where you can do research and using AIs or using open source material or getting these journals be out of paywalls into the open, uh, is called FuseMind. It's a a Google Chrome extension. It's smarter, search faster research, discover more than just a paper. FuseMind, uh, so this, I'm just going to read a little bit about it. Uh, for now, FuseMind works closely with papers held by uh, Arvex and PubMed. This means that we would cover biomed, life science, physics, math, and comp, uh, computer science. If your field isn't on the list, request it here and we'll add it ASAP. Good score. We're using an AI to develop a personalized paper relevance metric and soon developing an innovative and tailored academic search experience. For now, you can benefit from the alphametric attention score and a great measure of research and impact. Our extension works exclusively on top of Google Scholar, uh, PubMed, and ARX, uh, ARXIV, or ARVIX search. If there's any other sites you believe that we should be looking into covering, let us know. So basically what it is, is that you uh, can search something using this exchange engine and it allows you to have an understanding of where the paper is at, how it's distributed, uh, what people think of it from Reddit to Twitter to anything of that nature. And you can uh, find out more kind of down and in gritty details about uh, particular papers, subject matters, things of that nature. And you can find, well, what it is you're clicking on. Is it uh, very relevant to what you're looking at? Uh, do you need to go even deeper? Do you need to go somewhere else? I'm going to read a little bit more here from so from Fuse Mind Mission to Accelerate Discovery and Creating Knowledge. With over 50,000 new research papers published every week, finding relevant ones is becoming increasingly challenging. Giving students and researchers the ability to efficiently find those papers that truly matter to them, we believe is a paramount to the making of a better world. With better access to better information, the great minds of our generation can create better solutions faster. By reducing the, paper, paper, by reducing the barriers that prevent people from discovering knowledge, we hope to inspire more and more people to become a part of the scientific process that derives the world. What gets us up in the morning is the thought of a university student in a rural and isolated region being able to discover new and important knowledge at the same rate as a Stanford or Cambridge student. We're really excited and honored to have the opportunity to help drive the next wave of scientific discovery. So Fuse Mind. The manifesto of the, of the episode. Thesis on Making it in the Digital Age. Thesis on Making it in the Digital Age by Michael Deacher and Keith. Greet Lobkin, which it came out in 20. In our world, the maker is a true believer. We want to be self-made and to make ourselves over. It is no, it is no exaggeration to claim that the maker as an individual is a key figure of today's neoliberal on the uh, onto the theology. Forget about the fact that you're following some basic instructions. Just read the funky manual and bend reality to your will. One, the philosophy of making emerges at the time when theoretically. Projected of 60, the 1968's transition from the work of neg- negation and unmaking to embrace a vitalistic position. Our goal now is to move beyond the conventional teardown. Instead, we prefer the positive contribution of the many. Small is a new big, as the advertisement of the Dutch tortoise bank says. The system may be rotten, but it no longer needs to be take to be taken apart. To be taken apart. Stop the those pathetic punk gestures. It's sufficient to build new things. Show me yours. You want to know how to make history from a thousand small steps? This is crowdsourcing the general will. Tell us how to improve the world. We passionately try to create events and make a difference, even if we don't know how. Meanwhile, we attend spectacles for entertainment. Make a, making this a pragmatic, pragmatic resolution for the crisis in rhetoric. It is no longer cool to disagree. In this post-ideological era, it is no longer sufficient to have an idea. Who cares about your argument, your anger? We want your vision. It is tempting to reduce the cult of making to the so-called reality of working with our hands, but the subversive aspect of manual work is overrated. Let's stop play, placing it in contrast with the last anti-sports attitude of brain power. Richard Simmons the craft and embodies his aspirations for quality, the attempt to overcome primitive contradictions. Sentence emphasis the aimless and useless goal of the craftsman who represents the desire to do something well for his own sake. He also warns the reality of, on the grog is that people who aspire to be good craftsmen are distressed, ignored or misunderstood. Craftsmen suffer from the mistreatment. Before we start to celebrate the making of things, this is something to keep in mind. Despite the apparent sufficiency of the maker, the figure is still an outsider position in the academic content. There's a strong interest in supporting creative practitioners 
but we should acknowledge the confusion around this emphasis institutionally. Professional recognition and practice-based qualifications are still readily unsettled, while scholar output remains mainly calculated by articles, books, and citations. There's also expressed at the level of funding that either supports the problematic space of art science collaboration or budgets that are geared towards those projects that generate recognizable outcomes for intellectual markets. This is precisely why alternative perspectives and critical art dialogue is required on the status of the maker at this moment. If only to keep in check an inadequate audit culture for experimental, experimental research. The maker is always plural. We all know that we never make things alone. However, our experiences are not easily reconciled with current institutional models that rely so heavily on individual achievements. There is a real sense that collaborator remains a problem for the context and setting. Let's not forget, moreover, that the collective process of making things are often full of conflicts, miscommunications, and difficult compromises. But infrastructures are needed for the maker. Certainly, Anonymous offers a new model of some kind of collaboration. But we need to be very cautious about the sustainability of such formats. We feel constant pressure to invent and discover new tools to support collaborative effect, collaboration effectively. <clears throat> the maker culture clearly goes hand in hand with the positive theory of things as formulated by uh, actor network theory and its spiritual leader, Bruno Latula. Put inside his very anti leftist propagation, however, Lenore's way of thinking actually struggles to explain how historical change occurs. In the rush towards endorsing a articulate attitude, we need to be told that the entities are fully defined by their relations and that just the, the way things are. Recognizing non human agency seems like a noble endeavor, especially that this might open up avenues for other ways of acting. For instance, what Ian Bogus calls carpentry for philosophical artifacts. But what about the enigma of the creative critical thinking? Where is this difference that makes a difference? Or to put it this question another way, how can certain disasters, disasters realities now be unmade? Things fall apart. It's possible that stuff stops being productive. This is difficult and urgent concern for the vitalist position. We're constantly told that there are more resources to be found, appropriate or reused. That capital making never stops. It is irreducible. However, is there a moment when all the waste is simply remains too toxic for the makers, too unproductive for life? Seven. To stop making things is part of doing politics, but this strategy no longer works. Striking is definitely not popular. There are indeed complex questions of the agency here. We have moved from the strike to the occupation. People regularly stop making things due to unemployment. In this way, let's acknowledge that the front of the maker culture is situated in the project-led precarious economy. Eight. The critique of things may or may not be justified, but this should not be mixed with the urge to do stuff. The critique of society doesn't have to materialize itself in the material objects, not even the software. Beyond the tired dialects, the real and real. In virtual, there's internal demand for beauty. Nothing is real by, but design. We cannot discuss things outside of their shape, a uh, full story. The perfect object in the capitalism is the prototype, pornographer of concept design. The commodity fetish is more true than true, and not yet realized laboratory version is more real than the desired purchase. There is the pure thing. Nine. We are missing a critical theory of our prototype. There's an obvious risk that maker culture is ultimately reduced to the slow fabrication movement, or the kind of home science kick a la Make magazine. This is a general intellect as a lifestyle choice. Should pure tinkering just be celebrated as such, or should it be scaled distinct from the autonomous tweaking of technology? The prototype offers a model of idea type for many, existing between the workshop and factory. And 10. We cannot reduce the moment of creation. What is the distinction between the prototypical and the proto protocological? There are crucial questions of universal of universal utility that face the maker. But there these uh, scenes constantly withdraw from the circuits of global capital. The prototype, however, is never a first form, but always the next stage. Let's imagine a movement from demo design to prototypes to protocols. There should be this, These should be taken as the new conditions and the possibility after the creative industry. And that's it uh, for the digital manifesto of the episode. Thank you very much for listening and disconnecting for now, and I shall see you out on the street. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review Kaya through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review Kaya through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Hiroshima Space Odyssey Network production.